1980, near Sacramento, California, police respond to a call in a remote rural location. The victim, a young woman, shot at point-blank range. She had been kidnapped, bound, and sexually assaulted. She appears to be yet another victim in a string of crimes dubbed the Sex Slave Murders. The media was uh, all over this case. Law enforcement was very concerned for public safety. Could this happen again? Had it happened again? Could it be linked to other unsolved homicides? Along with police, there are those who chronicle the investigation up close, on film, on paper, and on tape. They are the public's first witness. Through their eyes, they capture our darkest chapters of crime. coastal climate, late back atmosphere, and rugged natural beauty draws thousands of visitors every year. Well, it's uh, southern Oregon coast, right on the ocean, major tourist area, lots of fishing going on, a lot of, uh, of uh, camping, that type of thing. The surge of tourists often leads to higher crime rates, but murder and missing persons cases are relatively rare. We had a number of instances where people would be climbing on the rocks and they'd end up in the ocean. But for people just to disappear, not real common. At the time, one local resident is Linda Aguilar, living in the coastal town of Port Orford. Linda Aguilar, was a 21-year-old young woman. Linda's friends would have described her as a friendly, outgoing person. Her boyfriend was, uh, was a commercial fisherman, worked on the boats. She reportedly was about four to five months pregnant, and her life, I guess, would have pretty much revolved around her child and her pregnancy at that time. June 7th, 1980. Without her own car, Linda decides to hitchhike south from her home in Port Orford to Curry County's largest town, Gold Beach. She had a doctor's appointment that day and she came to Gold Beach for that appointment. That evening, Linda fails to return home. Her boyfriend thinks she may be visiting family or friends in the area, but as the hours pass, he begins to worry. Numerous phone calls fail to shed light on her whereabouts. Unable to track her down, Linda's boyfriend eventually goes to police. She was reported missing. I was assigned to start working the case. We talked to a lot of people to try to determine if she'd made it back to Port Orford, or if they'd heard from her, or if there were any problems with her boyfriend that you know, might indicate she would just up and leave. At that point, it was pretty perplexing. We just didn't know what had happened to her. Along with circulating a missing persons report across the state, police turned to the community for help. Through newspaper articles, through local radio station information, whatnot, we asked for anybody that might have seen her if they would contact the sheriff's office. One local man comes forward. On the afternoon in question, he claims he was driving along the highway near Gold Beach when he saw a woman fitting Linda's description on the side of the road. As he passed by, a van stopped to offer her a ride. The man believes the van was gold in color. He was so vague about it at the beginning, we weren't certain that, that he'd actually seen her. Uh, all he caught was a clip, quick glance as he drove by. 
Although the sighting may be legitimate, police can do little without a license plate number or make and model of the van. As the days pass, fears of foul play grow. I thought uh, personally that, uh, that she had been picked up and, and kidnapped. Uh, there were just no other indications. The other possibility was her boyfriend, that uh, they might have had a fight and something happened to her in that instance and that he got rid of her. Two weeks later, two German tourists are visiting the area, walking their dog near a popular beach. And the dog was acting funny, attracted the, uh, the, the tourist's attention. And when he went to see what the dog was interested in, and saw part of a hip and part of a, a foot sticking out of the sand. Uh, they quickly notified authorities that the body had been found on the beach and the person was deceased. Police tape soon circles the grim discovery. Detective Sergeant Denton helps process the scene. My role was to handle evidence, to photograph the crime scene. Every time you remove a shovel of sand, every time you uh, touch anything, move anything around, uh, have to mark that and photograph it in place. Police slowly uncover the female victim. Nylon rope confirms suspicions of foul play. Her hands were behind her back and her legs were untied. But it was uh, you know, very obvious that it was a homicide or a murder case. Uh, people don't die that way without help. Not until the body is fully excavated can police confirm an identity. By all appearances, missing Linda Aguilar, along with her unborn baby, have been murdered. An autopsy reveals the full brutality of the crime. Along with blunt head wounds, a pathologist finds sand in Linda's lungs, suggesting she was actually buried alive. Her family was shocked and in pain that their uh, Linda had been killed the way that she had. And uh, no explanation as to why or who may have been involved in it. For police, the nylon rope used to tie the victim up may be a telltale link to the killer. The ropes were critical. The knots, how they were tied, right down to the number of strands in this particular rope. The kind of rope that was on her was uh, frequently used for uh, various things aboard the, the commercial fishing boats, which you know led us towards her boyfriend at that point. We used a piece of that, went to the fishing boat that he worked on, checked the rope there to see if it matched anything that might be there. The, uh, the rope did not match anything that we could find not only at it, on the fishing boat he worked on, but at his residence, uh, the thread count was wrong. Also, his alibi for that period of time seemed to be pretty solid, and eventually he took a polygraph examination, which I administered. There was enough indications that he was probably being truthful that uh, uh, we pretty much, had, pretty much had set him aside as a prime suspect at that point and started concentrating on the other information we had and following up on all these leads. Those leads include the possible eyewitness to Linda's abduction. The man who believes he saw Linda get into a van is interviewed again, this time under hypnosis. The man now feels the driver of the van had a dark complexion. He recalls a smaller figure sitting beside him in the passenger seat. The witness is unable, however, to recall any details from the license plate. It appeared that she'd been picked up by a passerby, a stranger, and of course they weren't around anymore. So um, we pretty much come to a dead end after following up all the leads. As the weeks pass, the case goes cold in Curry County police files. Thank <laughs> you.
But far to the south in California, the mystery van in question is on the move once more. Whoever is inside is about to strike again. July 1980. In Curry County, Oregon, police investigating the abduction and murder of Linda Aguilar and her unborn baby have reached a dead end. Their only lead is a vague description of a van that may have picked her up the day she went missing. Although the case has attracted plenty of local media attention, few are aware of it 450 miles to the south in Sacramento, California. Although smaller than many of the Golden State's other cities, Sacramento has recently had to deal with its own string of similar crimes. At the time, Sacramento was a large metropolitan area, but the murder rate, robbery rate, sexual assault rate in the Sacramento area was fairly high for such a conservative community. Although living in quieter West Sacramento, 34-year-old Virginia Mokul is well aware of the dangers that lurk in any urban area. Virginia spends many of her nights working at a local bar. She was a bartender. She um, was friendly, outgoing. Everybody that ever met her loved her. It was just a little friendly neighborhood bar. All the locals, you know, so they were regulars and they watched over her. They took care of her. When not at work, Virginia spends most of her free time with her children. Her hobbies mainly were her kids. They were her priority, period. There was nothing else in her life but her kids. I think she was working mainly to support us, my sister and I. She loved me a lot, and I was spoiled. <laughs> I remember her being just a great mom. July 16th, 1980. Virginia says goodbye to her children and heads into work. The evening starts off as a seemingly normal shift. The clientele are mostly regulars, but there are also a few unfamiliar faces in the crowd. As the night winds down, Virginia stays behind to close up the bar. She reassured me that there was usually one or two guys that stayed after and waited till she locked the door to the bar and got in her car. But for some reason that night, they didn't. She told them to go ahead and go, she'd be all right. And she went out to the parking lot and got into her car and was ready to drive off. And then there was a knock on her window. By morning, with no sign of Virginia, friends and family members spend the rest of the day trying to track her down. I couldn't figure it out. I mean, it just wasn't normal for her to not, not come home. And naturally, I was worried. Curiously, Virginia's car is still sitting in the parking lot at the bar. Her car was unlocked, like she was getting ready to get in it. I hoped nothing bad had happened, but you know, you always have in the back of your head something bad happening. Local police are notified. After checking area hospitals and morgues, they open a missing persons file. The investigation begins at the bar where she worked. They were trying to track down everyone who was at the tavern the night she disappeared. Police soon focus on the unfamiliar faces in the bar that evening. Among them, a group of men who had spent the day at a nearby river. A traveling businessman who some locals have found suspicious and a boisterous couple from Sacramento. Police speak with the suspects individually by phone. Everyone's story seems to check out, 
and nobody is able to offer any information as to where Virginia Mokul may have disappeared to. As the days pass, Virginia seems to have vanished into thin air. At the same time, Virginia's children are confused by their mother's sudden disappearance. I just thought she was missing, or had left. And he'd say, let's look for my mom, she's lost. You know how heartbreaking that is? When you hear a little boy help, wanting help finding his mom because she's lost? It's heartbreaking. October 2nd, 1980. Along the Sacramento River, miles from where Virginia worked, fishermen spot something along the water's edge. It is the body of Virginia Mokul, hidden beneath some brush. Local police, followed by homicide detectives, converge on the scene. Much like the Linda Aguilar case in Oregon, Virginia Mokul's hands have been bound. Instead of rope, fishing line has been used. That same day, Virginia's family learns the tragic news. The sheriff came to my house to let me know, and I couldn't believe it. Why would somebody want to take somebody like that? She didn't do anything to anybody. In the span of a few short months, two women have been abducted and murdered along America's west coast. Linda Aguilar in Oregon, and now Virginia Mokul in California. Although police have yet to connect the cases, a brazen attack in the months ahead will expose a serial killer at work, sparking a multi-state manhunt for one of America's most twisted criminals. November 1980. Police in both Curry County, Oregon, and West Sacramento, California have unsolved murders on their hands. Dead are Linda Aguilar and Virginia Mokul, both found half buried near water, their hands bound. With no knowledge that a serial killer is on the loose, residents in both areas go about their daily business. Among them are Mary Beth Sowers and Craig Miller, two college students living in Sacramento, only a few miles from where Virginia Mokul went missing. Mary Beth Sowers was a 21-year-old college student. She was engaged to get married to uh, Craig Miller. Uh, they both attended um, Sacramento State University. They were very much in love. They were probably the ideal couple. They seemed to have all the right stuff. On November 1st, 1980, Craig and Mary Beth attend a fraternity function at a local Sacramento restaurant. As the evening winds down, the two say goodnight to fellow students and head outside. And they left the restaurant just after 1 a.m. Then we're in the parking lot and accosted by someone holding a gun uh, who forced them into his car. Just so happens that one of Craig Miller's frat brothers was in the parking lot at the time and saw them being forced into the car. And he actually tried to intervene. He knew something wasn't quite right. When he got to the car, the female driver told him to back off. And he did. The car speeds off with Craig and Mary Beth inside. Early the next morning, the witness to the scene speaks with police. He contacted the authorities to tell them that his friends had been abducted. The frat brother got a pretty good look at the occupants of the car. He was able to tell the police what he saw, describe the two people that were in the car with his friends. Fortunately, he claims to remember the license plate number of the mystery vehicle. 
police confirm with Mary Beth and Craig's families and friends that they are indeed missing and launch an investigation. Disturbingly, much like the case involving Virginia Mogul, Mary Beth's car is still in the parking lot of the restaurant. Her keys are found on the ground nearby. Well, the families were very concerned. They knew that based on the statement of the frat brother that they had been forced into this car and they knew that it was probably going to be a bad situation. Police follow up on the license plate number noted by the young witness. According to their files, a car with that plate is registered to a 24-year-old local woman named Charlene Williams. Charlene was a person that came from a privileged background. Her father was an executive for a supermarket chain. She had the best of all worlds. Police visit Charlene at her parents' home. She denies being anywhere near the restaurant that Craig and Mary Beth attended. Police quietly note, however, that the vehicle parked outside seems to be a perfect match for the description given by the witness, right down to the seat covers. When pressed, Charlene explains that the night before, she was actually out with her boyfriend in his car, which is also parked at the house. Police take down his plate numbers as well. Uh, Charlene was able to convince them that, that she was elsewhere at the time, and they gave her the benefit of the doubt at that point. The police decided that she wasn't involved, and then they left. That afternoon, northeast of Sacramento, a man and a young boy are walking in a rural area when they noticed something unusual on the road ahead. Getting closer, they recoil at a terrible sight. The body of a young man. Uh, he was shot to death at point blank range. Police arrive and identify the victim as 22-year-old Craig Miller, still wearing his suit from the night before. Once a positive identification was made and his family notified and the police then continued a frantic search for his companion, Mary, hoping she was still alive. While some officers fan out through the rural area, others process the scene for evidence. Nearby, they find three 25 caliber shell casings corresponding to three bullet wounds in Craig's head and neck. A search of the area turns up no trace of Craig's 21-year-old fiance, Mary Beth. Now, with a clear case of murder, police try to revisit Charlene Williams, the woman whose car they believe was spotted when Craig and Mary Beth went missing. Curiously, she is now nowhere to be found. At the same time, police make a startling discovery. Tracing the license plate number of Charlene's boyfriend's car, police learn the vehicle is registered to one Stephen Fail, a name connected to the Virginia Mogul investigation. Stephen and Charlene appear to be the same couple who passed through a West Sacramento bar on the very night the bartender went missing. That same day, Charlene's parents come forward with yet another startling revelation. They explain that Stephen Fail is actually just a pseudonym used by their daughter's boyfriend. His real name is Gerald Gallego. Gerald Gallegos was a white male, mid-30s. As Gerald grew up in Sacramento, he got involved in local crime. He was sent off to different juvenile facilities. As he grew older, he got involved in more violent crimes. His record includes numerous robberies, as well as outstanding allegations of rape, sexual assault, and child molestation. According to Charlene's parents, their daughter has been living with the often violent Gallego off and on for the past three years. He had a track record as far as being able to charm women and use that to help charm Charlene when they met. 
Police now feel that 36-year-old Gallego, perhaps with the help of Charlene, may now be behind two, perhaps three different murders. Although not yet known to police, the couple also recently sold a van, much like the one spotted picking up Linda Aguilar six months earlier in Oregon. There was a lot of media coverage from the local TV stations in Sacramento, as well as from the Bay Area. Law enforcement was very concerned for public safety. There was some real fears going on in the Sacramento area during that time. A statewide search is launched for the couple, now seemingly on the run. If guilty, police fear it may not be long before Gerald and Charlene strike again. November 3rd, 1980. Police in Southern Oregon and Sacramento, California, are investigating the brutal murders of 21-year-old Linda Aguilar, 34-year-old Virginia Mokul, and 22-year-old Craig Miller. Craig's girlfriend, Mary Beth Sowers, remains missing. Prime persons of interest in the most recent killings are Gerald Gallego and his girlfriend, Charlene Williams, whereabouts unknown. If police are correct, they may now be hunting a rare and dangerous breed of criminal. Usually, most serial killers or mass murderers act alone. They usually come from a, a background where they're loners, they're sociopaths. It's very unusual in today to see a couple work in tandem together for police, a key link to the fugitive couple is Charlene's own parents. Well, I believe that the parents were shocked to learn that their daughter could be involved. They may have felt at that point that uh, if anything happened, it was because she was forced to participate from their perspective. And they hoped to use Charlene's mother to help locate them since apparently they were running low on money at that point and she was their one source to help them in that respect. As hoped, Charlene makes contact. Although she doesn't reveal their exact location, she does tell her mother that they have left California for neighboring Nevada. The tip turns a statewide search into a federal manhunt. Uh, the FBI became involved in the case once the suspects had crossed state lines. They were on the run at that point. A day later, police locate Charlene's abandoned car in a parking lot in Reno, the same car they believe was used to abduct Craig and Mary Beth. While forensic experts scour the vehicle for potential clues, other officers trace the couple north to Utah before losing them again after a stop in Salt Lake City. On November 16th, 1980, police finally get the break they've been waiting for. After several days on the run, Gerald and Charlene are growing desperate. They were in a motel and they were trying to figure out where to go, what to do, whom they could trust, if they could even trust each other. And they were very low on money. And so they hoped that they might be able to get some funds from Charlene's mother to tie them over for a while. Charlene makes contact once again. The couple have apparently made their way from Utah to the state of Nebraska. Her mother pleads with her to turn herself in, but also agrees to send money to a specific location in the city of Omaha. Fearing for her daughter's safety, Charlene's mother tells police the plan. November 17th, 1980, 11 a.m. In Omaha, Nebraska, plainclothes FBI agents take up positions both inside and outside of a money transfer establishment. 20 minutes later, they spot their prime suspects. Gerald keeps his distance down the street while Charlene heads inside on her own. As she approaches the teller, 
she is promptly placed under arrest. Around the same time, officers outside move in on Gerald, taking him into custody. The authorities surrounded him, and he gave himself up without incident. After countless man hours of investigation, police feel they have just apprehended two of America's most dangerous criminals. Once Gerald Gallegos and Charlene were arrested and found to be the suspects in a number of different homicides in the Sacramento area, the general public was greatly relieved. There was a calming effect within the Sacramento area. But the arrest comes too late to change the fate of one missing victim. Northeast of Sacramento, hunters come across the body of a young woman lying in a ditch. Police confirm that the victim is none other than 21-year-old Mary Beth Sowers. And like her fiance, Craig Miller, she has been shot three times in the head. Police recover three 25 caliber cartridges near the body. The mood was very solemn, very serious. When you get uh, a homicide of this um, nature, it stirs some real feelings within law enforcement community. While Mary Beth's family reels from the news, police work to build a stronger case against the Gallegos. Apart from eyewitness accounts connecting them to two different abduction scenes, they have little in the way of hard evidence tying them to the actual murders. At the Department of Justice Crime Laboratory, forensic expert Tori Johnson searches for that key link. Using a comparison microscope, he examines the 25 caliber shells and bullets recovered from the recent crime scenes. Every projectile is marked in a unique way by the specific gun that fires it, a ballistic fingerprint of sorts. Duplicate weapons uh, from a manufacturer will leave the same class characteristics, but within those are the microscopic marks, and that's where we see variation even between uh, what would appear to be identical weapons. Well, in this case, the first step for me was to see if the cartridge cases or the bullets from the Miller scene had any uh, relationship to the cartridge cases bullets from the Sauer scene, uh, which they did, uh, which thus established that a single firearm had been uh, used in, in both murders. But the firearm itself is missing. A search of Gallego's home does turn up a box of unused 25 caliber ammunition, but no murder weapon that might tie him directly to the crimes. An intriguing tip provides a possible breakthrough. Following the extensive media coverage, a woman who used to work with Gallego calls police. She remembers him brandishing a 25 caliber handgun at work one day. I understand that Gerald Gallego was working as a bartender and there was apparently somebody who had fallen asleep at the bar and um, Gerald was gonna, perhaps showing off was gonna scare him. And he said to watch this and he fired the gun to, to scare the guy. And of course that left the bullets in the ceiling. The tipster shows detectives the exact location of the incident. Embedded in the ceiling, they find a number of 25 caliber bullets. Back in the lab, they are scrutinized under the comparison microscope alongside the bullets recovered from the bodies of Craig and Mary Beth. Remarkably, they are a perfect match. I was able to say that the gun that was used to fire the bullets into the ceiling of the bar was the same gun that was used to kill Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sauer. So now we match the, the murder bullets to the bullets in the ceiling, which we had information that the suspect had fired. So it's a sort of a roundabout link. Adding to the evidence, an examination of the unspent box of ammunition from Gallego's home reveals a slight imperfection on the manufacturer's stamp on the bottom of some of the bullets. A visit to the factory that makes the bullets reveals that a batch of only a few thousand could ever have made it through quality control with that imperfection. That showed a pretty good likelihood that there was an association between that box of ammo and the murder bullets and cartridge cases. 
With the noose of evidence tightening, a confession of sorts emerges from the couple in custody. They both admit to being present when Craig and Mary Beth died, but each accuse the other of being the killer. Gerald was quick to portray Charlene as the perpetrator as far as uh, being the one to fire the shots uh, to kill Craig, whereas in Charlene's case, she was saying just the opposite, that he killed Craig, he sexually assaulted and killed Mary, and she was just more or less a victim herself, being forced to participate at risk of her own life. With a couple now divided, the biggest break for police lies ahead. It comes from Charlene herself. The couple's path of abduction, rape, and murder is far worse than anyone had ever imagined. January 1982. Police in California have Gerald Gallego and his girlfriend Charlene Williams in custody for the murder of university students Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers. In conversations with police, Charlene places the blame for the recent murders squarely on Gallego. She explains that she herself was a victim, intimidated by his violent nature to go along with his crimes. Knowing that she might face the death sentence if convicted, Charlene finally strikes a deal with police. She agrees to testify against Gallego in court, as well as give police a full detailed account of their crimes. The story that follows shocks even the most seasoned officers. Charlene explains that shortly after they met, Gerald began sharing his sexual fantasies with her. One fantasy involved having his very own collection of sex slaves. Fantasy, however, soon became reality. At Gallego's insistence, they bought a van with a bed in the back and began stalking young women. It was in that van that they picked up Linda Aguilar. She made the mistake of accepting a ride from a stranger, and she ended up becoming a victim at that point. She was sexually assaulted and bludgeoned, buried alive. But Linda Aguilar was not their first victim. He would solicit her to go out and obtain and make contact and solicit um, young women from different locations. Two years earlier, in September of 1978, Charlene approached 16-year-old Kippy Vaught and 17-year-old Rhonda Scheffler at a Sacramento shopping mall. Charlene was able to lure the young women through offering them marijuana. The women were willing to go with Charlene because but she looked trusting. And that was Charlene's job, and she did it to perfection. Once Charlene had led them to their van, Gerald brandished a gun and took control. They would kidnap them. She would watch as he would sexually assault them and physically abuse these young women. And eventually, he would leave her in the van and take these females off into remote areas and kill them and dispose of their remains. In June of 1979, the couple soon struck again. They picked up 14-year-old Brenda Judd and 13-year-old Sandra Coley from a county fair in Reno. The girls were raped, then killed. The following year, they abducted teenagers Stacy Ann Redican and Karen Twiggs from a Sacramento mall. Their bodies turned up along a riverbank, bludgeoned to death. In their final wave of attacks, the couple snatched Virginia Mokel from the parking lot outside the bar where she worked. Then, just a few months later, Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers became their last victims. Shocked by her lengthy confession, 
police confirm the details of the crimes. In Curry County, Oregon, the man who spent months investigating Linda Aguilar's murder learns of the breakthrough. Police officer there called and described the case to me and described our homicide. And then when he said, and our witness says that your, your victim was still alive when they, when they buried her. Well, of course, that was the key to the case right there. Everything fit our case on Linda. With 10 known victims, the sheer scope of the sex slave murders hits West Coast communities like a bombshell. It wasn't until uh, the public fully understood how many different homicides Gerald Gallegos had committed that the full impact of what had taken place over a period of time. And I think there was a great deal of shock to the local community. I felt for the other families because I know what they were going through. It's a shame that so many people have had to suffer. Knowing they only need one conviction to get a death sentence, prosecutors decide to go forward with their strongest case first. In November of 1982, Gerald Gallego stands trial in California for the first degree murders of Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers. It caused a lot of media sensation. It was followed by the media throughout the uh, full extent of the trial. I believe he was going to be found guilty. He should have. He, he took many lives. All for his lust. He was a creep. He was a total creep. He looked like a crook. To me, he did. Along with their ballistic evidence, police now have a star witness. As part of her deal with prosecutors, Charlene takes the stand against her ex-boyfriend. Adding to the courtroom drama, Gallego dismisses legal counsel and represents himself. He was somewhat confident that he could win the jury over. He would try to portray Charlene as more of a villain than a victim. Uh, she was able to hold up pretty well, and the jury believed her. In May of 1983, the jury finds Gerald Gallego guilty of first-degree murder and kidnapping. He is sentenced to death by gas chamber at San Quentin Prison. Fearing his death sentence may be commuted in California, prosecutors try Gallego in Nevada as well for the deaths of Stacy Ann Redekin and Karen Twiggs. The result is a second death sentence. I was one happy kid because I knew that justice was, was being done at that time. Well, it's not necessarily an arm for an arm or a leg for a leg, but I felt that he took enough lives that he deserved to be taken himself. Although present at every murder, Charlene gets away with a lighter sentence, one that angers many. As part of her plea bargain, she receives only 16 years in prison. Sometimes that has to occur in order to get a break in a case. Uh, you know, we don't know how involved she was. We don't know how controlling he was over her, how much she did voluntarily and, and instigated and whatnot. So there's always going to be some suspicion that she was more of a player than she actually appeared to be. In 1997, after serving her 16-year sentence, Charlene Williams was quietly released from prison. As for Gerald Gallego, he managed to postpone his execution on numerous occasions through appeals. In 2002, however, still sitting on death row, he succumbed to a long battle with cancer. To this day, the pain and grief caused by the sex slave murders remains. The memory of Gallegos traveling up and down the interstate a number of times with possibly a number of victims.
causes some real fears and memories that linger for a long time. As for Gerald Gallego and Charlene Williams, they still stand out as one of the most twisted partnerships ever encountered by American police. He ruined many families. He tore many families apart. I'm just glad that Gerald Gallego is no longer a threat to society. I feel the death penalty was the proper sentence. Too bad it wasn't carried out, but that's beside the point. He suffered. He suffered. <laughs>